It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. Welcome. I'm Dan Dranko with Climate Nashville. I know a lot of you, but also it's good to see some faces that are new to me. Um, we're one of the hosts tonight, along with uh, Lauren Bush, who did a lot of work on this with uh, Sockham. And she had to work late, so she's going to be joining us a little bit uh, down the line. Um, Climate Nashville, we're, we're one of the, we're the, very active climate group. We work very closely with the Sierra Club, uh, 350.org, other organizations. We all work together very collaboratively to bring more renewables, bring more energy efficiency, and to deal with this uh, tremendous crisis that we're in right now uh, with climate. And um, we're delighted to have uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists out to talk to us, um, coming all the way from Washington, uh, there's Lauren, and I'll have her. Yeah, that's Lauren Bush, who did a lot of work on this. So let's, uh, give Lauren a hand. And I'm also going to pass this around. Um, it's helpful if you want to know about our future events. Uh, you can always pick on it with Facebook and all the ways people do nowadays, but if, uh, this can get you on our email list and you can find out about events. If you're, not, uh, if you're already on our email list and you're getting stuff, just put your name down. Uh, otherwise, it would be great if you can add your email uh, to this so uh, we can keep you informed in the future. Yes. Yeah. This is a local list for events we're doing here in Nashville. And now I'm delighted uh, to introduce Sarah Pendergast, who's going to introduce the folks, the rest of the folks who came in with her uh, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to Climate Nashville and for Lauren Bush and Sockham for getting us together tonight. We've been taking a bit of a tour around um, Tennessee. We are in Knoxville and Oak Ridge, Chattanooga, and then here all week. Um, we all work on the climate and energy program at Union of Concerned Scientists. We're a science-based advocacy um, group for both scientists, engineers, economists, public health professionals, but also non-scientists, but people who care about science policy. So we're glad to see you here tonight. I'm going to introduce my colleagues. Rob Cowan, he's the director of government affairs, so he's the one that brings scientists to Congress and to agencies to push for the issues we care about. Ashanti is our media specialist, so she talks to the lo local newspapers to push stories to encourage better um, coverage of climate and energy issues. She's actually from right here in Nashville and went to University of Tennessee. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, feel free to grab extra buttons or anything else before you go, stickers. The larger packet is a toolkit we've specialized in Tennessee. Um, inside is um, contact information for Anusha. She's the point person for any organizing. Um, the first page is a letter to Senator Alexander. Your senator is very powerful. Rob will tell you more about that. Um, a couple pages on a few advocacy tool tactics we'd suggest, like meeting with your members of Congress and their staff and writing into uh, newspapers. So those are all tools for you. If you'd like to take another one for a friend, feel free. We have plenty. Uh, and lastly, we also have a sign-in sheet if you'd like to sign it. Um, expertise is because we have something called the Science Network. It's a free uh, training and um, networking tool for us to engage experts on different issues. Um, and here's Rob. Hey, thanks, Sarah, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, my name is Rob, and I um, kind of uh, run the government affairs work for, for Union of Concerned Scientists on climate and energy issues. Uh, as you guys, I'm sure, no doubt understand, it's a very uh, challenging uh, political environment in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, one of the uh, biggest challenges that we have is actually the federal budget, um, which, unfortunately, uh, 
is in some of our, our budgetary priorities are increasingly um, coming under attack uh, with the new administration and um, with, with some of the folks in Congress. Um, our priorities on kind of science and clean energy and climate change um, are really in the crosshairs. And just to kind of give you an understanding of how much that is the case, um, take for instance the Department of Energy budget, uh, really which is critical to our clean energy uh, capacity and primacy, everything from clean energy innovation to a lot of the progress we've made on energy efficiency with, with standards and some critical energy efficiency programs that help low income folks reduce their electricity bills like the weatherization program. A lot of that has actually been targeted for elimination by the administration. Um, they're looking to cut the energy efficiency and renewable energy program at Department of Energy by a whopping 70 percent. So that's not that's not a cut. That's that's basically almost an elimination of the program. Um, this be, this is the wind technology office. This is all the energy efficiency stuff I was talking about. It's the solar office and hydro and geothermal and all that stuff. That's a real problem. Also our clean energy, our early stage uh, innovative clean energy program, which we call ARPA-E. So this is a program where the government essentially uh, fills a gap in the private sector where risk and cost is high. Uh, so you don't have a lot of private sector investment in the early stages of technology, clean energy technology, because it's very risky. And it's proper for the government to play that role in early stage investment. And we've seen that lead to a variety of different technologies, new products, new businesses, uh, everything from even the fracking revolution, actually, the, the drilling technology uh, was really from DOE. So um, this is actually just common sense stuff from an economic standpoint. But unfortunately, the budget is uh, very ideological with respect to the administration, and they uh, propose to eliminate that program entirely. And then there's other things like the Office of Electricity and Delivery and Reliability, which sounds pretty wonky. They focus on energy infrastructure, so it's things like transmission, uh, smart grid, uh, grid modernization, battery storage, stuff that reduces our vulnerability to power outages and to cyber attacks. And we know extreme weather is uh, increasing with climate change, so this is really, really important stuff. And that is targeted for a cut anywhere between 65 to 80 percent. So our priorities are really in the crosshairs with respect to the administration and their allies. And I think it's really important for us to be uh, out of the, the coastal states uh, and really to get into as many, uh, as many areas in, in, that are more red as we can to talk about uh, really the value of, of some of these priorities. And especially when it comes to Tennessee, uh, y'all are very well linked to, for example, energy innovation in a variety of ways with with the labs and all the good work that's going on uh, at, at University of Tennessee and, and Vanderbilt. Uh, this stuff actually affects the universities and affects the labs too. An example would be a third of all the money in that energy efficiency and renewable energy program goes to the labs. About 115 million, for example, went to uh, Oak Ridge uh, in 2015 from that program. So when you, cut, when you cut that stuff, it's not that you're just cutting uh, you know, uh, renewables that affect somebody else. This actually affects uh, Tennessee uniquely from a job and economic standpoint. And I wish I could make the argument to folks about the general benefit of, of clean energy uh, from an environmental standpoint and have that be the winning argument. But it, that's just not the way uh, things work. Um, when you're talking to different audiences, you really have to figure out what's important to them. And we all know jobs is important. And so that's, we, we make our arguments. Uh, on the economic value, the jobs value, uh, and obviously there's public health benefits, uh, but um, that's, that's where we're focused right now. Uh, specifically with respect to y'all's representation, uh, Senator Alexander, I believe, I can't see your senior senator or junior yeah. senator, it's hard to know because the senior senator uh, is actually somebody we can work with. Uh, he's not a renewable energy champion and I don't think he ever will be. But he's not a climate denier, he hates wind, he's not a climate denier. <laughs> he understands that investments in science and innovation and research is actually a pro-growth strategy. Uh, and so he, and he's supportive of the labs and supportive of clean air energy, energy that doesn't produce uh, emissions, uh, harmful health emissions, so he's a big nuclear guy. But 
He's somebody we can work with. I'm sorry? Which is pretty harmful. Well, hey, I'm not, I'm not making the case that nuclear is great. I'm just more saying that he does understand the, the, the issues associated with fossil fuels and public health, which is at least something, and not all people fully understand that. So this is somebody we can work with. He's actually the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Energy and Water. So he basically helps determine how much money the federal government spends on DOE, on all those programs I talked about. And even though he's predisposed, I think, to supporting some of that stuff, he needs to be well supported at home to fight there. The more well supported at home he is, the more likely he is to fight for these priorities. And as I said, he's not predisposed to being a supporter of renewables in general. So we, we're really working with our um, membership and trying to um, forge new uh, alliances and meet new folks uh, to really help uh, invest in Tennessee, help support Senator Alexander in making the right decisions, and also hold him accountable uh, to the extent that he doesn't. Um, and our membership is um, it's, it's a mixed membership of a variety of different people people in the STEM fields at the labs, but also just concerned citizens who really care about these issues and elevating those voices, not just directly to the members, but also uh, in media, so they're reading about it, is absolutely critical. This is our tool for advocacy and it works, believe it or not. Um, so uh, we would love to just also learn from you all a little bit about um, kind of the political environment, all the good work you're doing, uh, understand how we can support you guys in the good work and how we can have synergies in our work to the extent that you care about these science and energy priorities um, and really build a stronger voice, a strong network here in Tennessee uh, to kind of hold these members accountable and make some progress federally. We think it's good for the country. We think it's good for Tennessee. Uh, we're looking forward to making a longer term uh, investment in the state. Uh, it's important that we get out of the blue states and we really start uh, you know, getting into places and talking to folks and uh, building uh, relationships uh, in places that aren't always predisposed to supporting uh, the way we think. And that's just what has to happen and we got to start somewhere and we're, we're really dedicated to, uh, to a longer term commitment that way. Uh, without taking too much longer, I'll just mention that this stuff is happening right now. In Congress, they're writing these bills uh, actually this week they began the process of marking up the energy and water bill in the House. The Senate will likely, uh, is writing the bills right now, but they will act on that stuff after the July recess. Uh, next week, or, uh, uh, members of Congress will be back for a recess. It's an opportunity to weigh in with them in state, in district, if you guys have time. There's a number of different ways you can do that through uh, sign-on letters, you know, making a phone call to your member of Congress, setting up um, some sort of more formal in-district meeting, uh, a drop by. Um, there's just so many different ways to actually make your voice heard and I can't stress how critical that is. I'm sure many of you guys are um, very well steeped in understanding uh, kind of the, the fine points of advocacy and I know a lot of you guys are active and engaged. But really that is the, that is the tool we have at our disposal is folks' zeal to, to actually get up and exercise their voice as a constituent and these guys have to listen to you. They work for you. Uh, so they're hearing a lot from, from, from a lot of interest up there. Uh, I'm sorry? It's good for them to be reminded. It's good for them to be reminded, absolutely. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's another world up there, so it's really easy to forget that for some of these guys. But they come home and they get a dose of reality if folks are motivated and expressing their opinions on these issues. So as Sarah referred to, we have a packet that talks a little bit about uh, some of the, the ideas we have for effective advocacy, different ways, a menu of options people can, can take regardless of their expertise or the amount of time that they have. There's, there's ways to make a difference there. And Ashanti can talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the ways that we can exercise our voice through the media uh, to be able to make sure um, that these folks are kind of reading, uh, that, that folks are watching, watching them and care about these issues in the local paper. Uh, and right now is the time. So. Um, uh, I'll just introduce uh, Ashanti Washington, who's a Nashville native, formerly working at Oak Ridge University of Tennessee grad, uh, and uh, she'll talk a little bit about our, uh, our media strategy. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm a little shorter than Rob. Is that better? Yes, better. 
Awesome. Uh, thanks y'all for having us out here. Again, as Rob and Sarah said, I'm Ashanti. Uh, I grew up right down the street. I went to MLK Magnet, so this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. So I'm really, really excited to get the chance to talk to you all. So again, thank you to Dan and Lauren, if, or Laura, excuse me, to having us come on out here and having the Unit Concerned Scientists um, come and talk to you all about our our concerns uh, when it comes to the energy budget and again, clean energy and climate writ large. But in particular, and something that's really partial to me is how it impacts Tennessee. Um, again, I'm a little biased, but of course, uh, you all, as Rob mentioned, have a key role in playing how this, uh, in dictating how this plays out on the federal level. Um, so as he mentioned, there are a couple inroads when it comes to advocacy, and one of the inroads that I'm really interested in and what I really do with UCS is helping with media. Um, so my main role is to connect uh, people like you, experts, um, both scientists and community advocates who know what's going on in the ground, to journalists to make sure they get the story right to make sure they're informed about the issues at hand and making sure that it's being covered in the local press. Because again, if we're covered in local press, that means it's getting in front of your, your representatives. Um, so a little bit more background on that. Your, lo your representatives, both local and federal, get news clips every day. So they have staffers who track what's going on in the broadcasts, that's tracking what's mentioned in the radio, and also what's mentioned in print, both thematically and also when their name is called out. Uh, so, for instance, Senator Lamar Alexander has a staffer who tracks every day what's coming off at the Tennessean, the Knoxville News Sentinel, even the National Post. Uh, so what you all have as inroads in between your in-district meetings and your phone calls is to dictate what's happening in the press. Because again, this is about what your voices are here locally and what your neighbors are saying and what they should be paying attention to. What's the point of the news if it's not relevant to you all? So one of these options that we have here is to dictate that in the form of a couple options. Um, so we have op-eds. Op-eds are longer form pieces. You all are talking about what's going on the, the pike and everyone wants to know about the most newsworthy thing, which as he mentioned, um, will be the energy budget coming up in the next couple weeks. Um, so you, if you all have the expertise in the background, feel free to try to write an op-ed, which is 500 to 700, or 500 to 700 words. Um, and you can try to get it placed in the Tennessean. But sometimes it's a little bit challenging. And so another option that you have is a letter to the editor. So has anyone in here ever written an LTE, a letter to the editor? All right. Next time, let's try to get everyone in the room to do that because that means we're really setting the tone and setting the conversation to a point where your representatives, Cooper, Megan Berry, even Lamar Alexander cannot ignore it. If there is so much being said in LTEs for the Tennessean the commercial appeal across the state, that you really can't ignore it. Um, so one of the inroads for this is to write a quick response to a news story. So recently there's a news story talking about TVA's steadfast commitment to transitioning and sticking to the Paris Climate Agreement and sticking to clean energy goals. These are opportunities to write a quick response. And so LTEs are uh, really, really short and simple and easy. So oftentimes Sarah and Rob and I get questions about we are really busy throughout the day. We want to be advocates. We know to make phone calls, but how can we also do something that's short, quick, we only have 30 minutes to do something that makes a difference? If you have 30 minutes, you can write an LTE. So what you do is keeping up with the news, which is what you all are probably doing as it is. Yes? What about the uh, groups that send you an email saying, just put your name in and we'll send it out? Are those effective or worthless? Um, editors keep up with these things. So editors get an influx oftentimes when these emails come out and they see it's the cookie cutter style. Um, and so they're not necessarily as effective as it would be if you were purely responding. So as Sarah mentioned, we have a packet here and inside the packet are like quick four questions that you can answer with one sentence each. This is a way, it's a, sort of a guide, but it's not necessarily cookie cutter, hey, my name here, enter and send. This is a way to sort of get our common message here and also have a, a standardized uh, message here for all the, the newspapers, but not necessarily be ignored by editors. They kind of turn a blind eye once they get 50 of the same version. So thank you for that. Um, but a great response is to be able to sort of pay attention uh, in 30 minutes to send a quick LTE in between making a five minute phone call to your representative about an issue, um, particularly with the budget. Um, but just taking 10 minutes to respond to a story um, that's going on. So when it comes to the Tennessee, for instance, or even the National Post, there are several stories about climate and energy um, in Rick Perry, uh, increasingly of late. Um, some of them are positive, a lot of them are not so positive. This is your chance to respond and also get your perspective out there and urge 
Senator Lamar Alexander to do the right thing, to defend the DOE budget, to defend these innovative technologies that make Tennessee a powerhouse, that employ so many people to help sit there and create programs for Vanderbilt. This is an opportunity for you to give feedback and urge him to do the right thing. So story comes up. You have 30 minutes, half of your lunch break. You want a chance to not only just call somebody or just be put on hold or send a quick email to Lamar Alexander. You want to make sure that you have an additional step. So you take 10 minutes to read the article. Great. So in here, they have a couple of questions. It takes about 15 minutes to have a four sentence response. You really want to shoot for 100 to 200 words for it. Um, saying this is what's covered in the article. I resonate with this because you know Rick Perry needs to know that we are Tennessee. Tennessee has an energy powerhouse here. We are employing so many people when it comes to ERE, the Energy uh, Efficiency Renewable Energy Program. Um, I believe that if we have these budget cuts, this will cut our economic powerhouse here. Um, I am say your expertise, your why you care. I'm a national native. I live here. I work for Vanderbilt, so on and so forth. And then the last sentence will be Senator Lamar Alexander, stand up and defend Tennessee. Um, short, sweet, and simple. Uh, and this really sets the tone for what needs to be said. And it's also making editors aware. And so the third option that kind of snowballs after this, when enough people are sort of responding, having LTEs, getting their neighbors to notice what is concerning, which is climate, energy, and clean energy programs here, is that editors take notice at these newspapers. And so follow-up is to have editorial board me meetings. So leaders in the community, even you all, can send an email and say, hey, I know that you've paid attention to what's going on in the news here. I know that you've been paying attention to your, your LTE section. Can we sit down and talk about this? I know that you want to cover what's newsworthy, and you're seeing that the community think this, thinks that this is newsworthy. So let's have an informational session. So ed board meetings are great because a lot of the times journalists are stretched thin. They are covering a gambit of, of uh, news stories, jumping from sports to what's going on in the community to crime. They can't really dig in deep the way that you all know and how you all have been working on these issues. So setting up these meetings after you have a little bit of traction in the newspaper with LTE is a perfect way to get them informed and hopefully get them to write an editorial piece. And so most newspapers should, by all means, report on news objectively. But editorial pieces are different. This is an anonymous piece, as you all probably know, written by Ed Board members that says, we have seen what the community says, we have seen what's going on, and this is our opinion on it. And this is a way to have even more of an impact, so not just you, but having an editor of a newspaper, the Tennessean, saying, hey, Lamar Alexander, we see that everyone here cares about this. We see that people across the state are caring about this and we need to take a stand and alert you that we also need you to do the right thing. So there's a little bit of a snowball effect, but really at the end of the day, an LTE is a great way to let your neighbors know who may not be sitting here that this is something they need to be concerned about, that we need to defend clean energy here in Tennessee, that there's opportunities for this to, in the next couple months throughout the summer as they're marking up the bills, as the budget's progressing, as we're concerned about other things that are moving, but we still want to preserve our jobs and our expertise and our science innovation and knowledge creation center here in Tennessee. This is a great time to let your neighbors know and let senators know and let the editors know of newspapers that this is what you all care about and this needs to be moving. Do we all have any questions? I know that we have a couple of options here. You can go to our website too for some tips and sample LTEs. But do you all have any questions about how to submit anything? Yes. What's the effectiveness of going to, say, Lamar Alexander's um, Facebook page, social media? So that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned, they have staffers who monitor print media, broadcast media, but they also have staffers who are increasingly monitoring social media. And so one of these options is to go to their Facebook page and comment. You can do it in a variety of ways. You can comment and say on Twitter, for instance, at Lamar Alexander, hey, we see that you're you know, head of the Appropriations Committee for the Energy Budget. We want to make sure that you defend EERE program here in Tennessee. They track that. They get that hit, and they archive it. Um, another option is to go to Facebook and comment, but also if you see an article or if you post an LTE and that's shared online, you can take that link, drop it into Facebook, and at Lamar Alexander so you can see that you said this both in print, print the, the online version, have it both in print and on his Facebook page so you can have twice the impact. And of course, if you have people on Facebook who care, they can start liking, they can start sharing it, and it gets traction both socially and on in print. So that's a great option. If you all are on Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn, they are archiving this with their, their staffers. Yes? I understand this. This is, this is good information. Sure. However, I'm having turn about how the environmental movement is practical. And, uh, you know, I've said some time with Bobby, is saying in pretty much saying the same thing in here. And they're, they're pushing uh, a carbon tax. And there's a number of us here who have been part of the 
this is to collaborate. So I just encourage collaboration where there can be because we're kind of duplicating our efforts in some respect. So it's an excellent organization. We are, we collaborate with them very closely. Uh, we work with them very closely, for example, with members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, and they helped form the Climate Solutions Caucus, which we're also uh, heavily uh, working with them as well. Um, they are focused, as you rightly said, on that single issue platform of a revenue neutral carbon tax. We absolutely think we need a carbon tax. We support that at UCS, maybe not necessarily revenue neutrality, but we're, we're aligned on that. And um, with respect to clean energy and things of that nature, we think that's part of the package as well. Um, so we're focused on that as well. But absolutely, uh, continued collaboration with those kinds of groups, and we really respect the work they're doing and appreciate your involvement as well, sir. a bit busy right now. <laughs> no, we, we haven't written them off. Uh, it, it, it's just that, um, you know, he's, he's just not as relevant to making some of the decisions around uh, energy policy, for example, as Senator Alexander is. Now, I really wish Senator Corker had, uh, had made his voice known uh, in favor of staying in Paris a little bit more aggressively. That's a way that he might have been able to exercise his voice as the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, which is a pretty big, pretty big position, uh, and we got a long way to go with him on this stuff. Uh, but I th it's important to be strategic and focused, in ter and, and timing is really important, as I said, around this stuff. So right now, you know, we are focused on Alexander. We are focused on uh, Representative Fleischman, for example, uh, down south, who, who represents uh, the Oak Ridge Lab, and he's on also one of those appropriations committees. Um, but ultimately, I think it's helpful for all y'all's members, uh, both senators and, and your representative of Congress, regardless of what committees they are, to know how you feel. It's just that from a prioritization standpoint, we've chosen to prioritize those folks who we feel can make the biggest difference given their position in Congress. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question, but I've had a lot of back and forth with Senator Alexander, and there are two positions that are dear to his heart. One is the Great Smoky Mountains, and the other is the Oak Ridge National Resource Laboratory, which you were part of. Yes. And if you can in any way integrate those into your comments, <laughs> he will pay more attention to that. Sure. I, I think that's exactly right, Bill. Uh, thank you for, for flagging that for everyone as a whole. And a great way to kind of communicate that is to bring it back to tradi two traditions, which resonates, I think, across the state. Um, a big part of why we're here with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and with the Great Smoky Mountains that is part of our tradition. We are environmentally oriented, even though some may not think that, because we have such beautiful uh, natural landscapes. And part of why we have the lab here is because we have a tradition of science innovation through the Manhattan Project. So if we can tether this argument for continuing to support DOE and continuing to support clean energy technologies because it's part of the Tennessee tradition, that could also resonate and hit both of those notes. But thank you. Uh, so, Alex, Lamar Alexander also has one other position, regulation. He claims they're job killing when it's kind of obvious that the reason that he doesn't like them is they, you need someone to enforce someone or to carry out the actions to do it. Basically, you need jobs, and jobs are expensive, so com companies would rather get rid of them. How do you defuse that without having to go through explain, explaining all the facts? Because that is his automatic response, is to talk about job filling regulations. On the methane rule, for example, job filling regulations. Uh, so one of the programs that's targeted for cuts, and again, uh, our representative uh, Rob can speak on this a little bit more, uh, but the RPE program, uh, this funds uh, energy technologies that can't quite make the market because they're too high risk for investors to come into there. So RPE helps get these technologies to the market to help them be licensed and bolsters that public-private partnership that leads to economic benefits for Tennessee. So again, his arguments don't really resonate, and I think the great opportunity is to pick up on that and say, you say regulations and these actions are job killing, but really RPE helps facilitate jobs, help fa helps facilitate economic benefits and innovation here. Um, and so that really translates to jobs. 
And I think that a great opportunity is to pick out where what he's saying is not really resonating through his actions in the budget. Yeah, just add to that is, uh, yeah, the regulatory pathway is closed to us uh, in the current political environment with the current administration uh, and Congress. But fortunately for us, it's not the only way we can make progress on climate. And what I like to try to say is if folks have problems with regulation, I like, first of all, I don't call them regulations. I call them standards and safeguards. But, um, but you know, if, if you know the audience you're talking to and you know that argument's not going to hold weight, why don't we say, hey, let's innovate our way out of the problem. You see, you, can, you can't close all of the pathways, right? I mean, you can't, you can't cut our, our ability to understand the problem and then also to innovate our way out of the problem and then also not to be able to restrict the harmful emissions that are causing the problem. And I think with someone like Alexander and many other uh, conservatives, they do understand the value of innovation as a pro-growth strategy. And that's the way I think you really push back on this argument around regulations. It's also about innovation, economic growth, and really running with an opportunity of clean energy, uh, just creating jobs every day across the country. So it strikes me that if, um, any, any representative or senator rates job killing aspects of regulations um, as serious compared to the consequences of climate change, doesn't, either doesn't believe climate change or doesn't think it's all that important. And I'm wondering, I don't think Alexander, Alexander's not a denier, I don't think, but I, he's never seemed to take it very seriously. Is that your reading on it? I mean, if he still considers job losses from regulations as more important, then he really hasn't taken it very seriously. I think the Republican Party has a uh, uh, general attitude against regulation. You know, it's generally across the party line, not just in our center. Yeah, but they used to be soft on some, they obviously accept some regulations. So. Let's say it's not high on his priority yeah. list relative to other issues, but he, he, he does believe in the science of climate change. But we, we know that for a fact. We've had numerous conversations, some with him, some with him directly, some of them staff. But uh, he, he, he gets the science. There's a question of how important he thinks it is from a policy standpoint and what those policy measures are. He is actually interested in working on uh, solutions to that, uh, to the problem in keeping with his philosophy about how he thinks we should solve a problem. So big nuclear and, and things of that nature. Now they're not always the right prescriptions, but at least he's acknowledging that it's a problem, right? And he's willing to work with Democrats and other folks to solve that problem. I'd say the thing, the reason why he's a little more muted and why you wouldn't really know that um, is because they're very concerned about their, uh, about their position in the state with respect to getting primaried, uh, and is, they're very cognizant that the state's very conservative, as you all know. Uh, I think you all went for Trump uh, in the primary, right? And we all did. they did. <laughs> <laughs> not not you all, but I'm pretty sure the state went for Trump in the primary, in the Republican primary. And they never miss an opportunity, by the way, to remind us how tough it is in the state for them to, to, to do the right thing on clean energy and climate. And that's why we like to try to say, well, let, let Let's try to help you. We're going to try to elevate those voices in the state. We're going to try to get our, our science uh, membership to help support you. We want to be a resource for you. Let us help you. Do the right thing on this. And that, that's the way we work with him. But it, it takes a lot of work to get these guys to, to really step out there. And, but he, he's not a denier. He's somebody we can't work with. Uh, and then next. If you all didn't hear him, he said between 2015 and 2016, the most rapid growing field has been in solar. Um, can I, uh, Lisa, no, maybe too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm really concerned with Alexander's really loving little nukes and thinking that nuclear power was a clean alternate energy. And that's one of the dirtiest energies around. And I wondered if, if, he, if you talk to him and if he actually realized this, because I hadn't heard him talking about nukes in the last couple well, of months. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there's not a lot of good news to say about nukes uh, <laughs> with respect to just how they're competing in the market. Uh, and certainly with a lot of the new nuke technologies, um, we're, you know, it's, there's a whole uh, 
gap of economic competitiveness that they have to cross to even really get a foothold in the market to begin with. I think we, we start with him. Uh, we're not, in, we're not, UCS itself is not necessarily uh, anti-nuclear energy, but we are very vigilant about nuclear power safety. We consider ourselves a nuclear power safety watchdog organization. And that is actually the way we take positions on the issue of nuclear power. With someone like Senator Alexander, it's, you know, it's all about trying to find common ground. But they're just not really opportunities to decarbonize the, the, the country with nuclear because nuclear is unfortunately not economically competitive. And, and that's just what it is. It's, it's natural gas, it's cheap gas, it's really high operating costs and high capital costs. And until those things are addressed, nuclear is not really a threat uh, relative to renewables, the growth in renewables. But unfortunately, it's also not necessarily going to play a big role. Uh, I would say it's not going to play a big role in the future in terms of decarbonizing the economy. So in some ways, it's a bit of a distraction. The one area that I do think that is uh, uh, appropriate to have a, a, a discussion about is the existing fleet, because we know in certain places when those closed down, they were replaced by gas, uh, which we know from a climate standpoint is a real threat from an emission standpoint. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's certainly a conversation to have about you know, plant safety, operating plants. Uh, a lot of states are exploring bailouts, for example, to keep plants open. And there's storage. a, I'm sorry? Storage. 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 Well, storage, which I think will literally overcome the issues around other, you know, essentially storage, I think, makes here's renewables. Here's waste storage. Okay, yeah, but at battery storage, I think, ultimately is the key that's going to get renewables to the place where people are talking about that, as well as all the, you know, in line with all the other baseload technologies. We have a hand in the back. That's right. I mean, to the extent that we're talking about resources that can either go somewhere or somewhere else, we certainly would rather see them go into energy efficiency and renewables, which we know is the real solution to climate change. Um, but you still have a lot of people who, who are very supportive of that technology. So, one of the things that I'm gathering in this conversation is the mode of PR. I think that's a great observation. I think another point to make there is that a lot of the way that folks get their news is to turn on their TVs or you know get the five o'clock news or pick up the newspaper. Um, so another way to inform people and educate people is both through meetings and just calling up even, I don't know exactly where you're from, um, but if you're living out in Smithville, for instance, you can probably call the local paper and say, hey, I know you're covering a lot of things. Um, can I tell you about this? And inform the journalists who can disseminate that information, inform the local broadcaster, and then maybe they can start helping do that work for you too. Yeah, but we're, and, and to say on that level, exactly. Uh,
Yeah, I also think it's, a, it's challenging, you're right, because uh, uh, it's, I, I find that it's also important to find a way to meet people halfway. Because I, I hear, you know, there's a lot of kind of, um, there's a narrative around environmental politics and environmental activists that essentially is you're elitist, you're, 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 you're in a bubble, and by the way, don't tell me what to do, don't tell me how I'm supposed to act. And I, I, I actually can, can really respect that feeling of, you know, no one likes to be pontificated to from somebody who thinks they know more than them. So it's a delicate balance. You're absolutely right. There's a huge education gap, and how we approach that is everything. Because you can alienate people, or you can really bring them in, uh, and, and that's, that we're very cognizant of that in the way that we approach folks and the way that we uh, kind of uh, tweak our messages for audiences. We never change the, the, the value of the message and what's important, but we're very cognizant of walking that line between you know, not, not pontificating <laughs> to people, but also trying to, trying to work with them to show them the benefits. Education. Educate folks, yeah, yeah and, and kind of illuminate the benefits of, of, uh, of some of the things that we think are important. Thank you, then that's all right. Yes. I think one of the best ways to make our cities resilient and deal with climate change is to plant more trees. And um, I just happen to be the city critical, so that's what I preach on. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to work statewide in urban forestry for a nonprofit and go to Washington quite a bit and work on our budget. And it's um, going to be zero now urban community forestry program in the Department of Forestry. Mm -hmm. And that has a work. big impact on our air quality, stormwater, and our heat index and temperature. Mm -hmm. And it's just so short-sighted, I think. Oh, I mean, I mean that, it, it's wonderful for everything. I mean, planting trees, planting trees is absolutely incredible for everything from energy, you save in energy, to, to everything else. I mean, that's a great way to make a difference. But is that something you all work on, even though it's kind of side, but it still impacts climate change? We haven't worked as much on kind of, you know, built urban infrastructure with respect to, you know, using the natural environment for that. Um, we're supportive of it. It's not one of the things that UCS specializes in, but it absolutely is critical. I mean, it's another example of how somebody can make a difference. Planting a tree does help. You know, could debate about how much it helps. But it dissipates in the urban environment, yes. the heat island effect. Yeah. And not many other things can do that. I think it's incredibly important. So I would encourage you to get involved. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I saw a hand in the back. Um, you, sir? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask if you were involved in any way with Al Gore. No. I'm not, no, not involved with Al Gore uh, at all, uh, in any way, uh, yeah. And he's not involved with your organization? No, he's not no. involved in our organization in any way, no. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was just gonna say, in addition to growing trees, a thing that people could do on their own, no matter where they live, is go more towards the plant-based diet, because it takes so much energy to raise the cows, you know, and if there was less demand, there would be less supply, you know. So there's that. Another thing I wanted to mention is I saw earlier on the Rachel Maddow show today something about that there was a scientist, and I can't remember her name, but she had already given testimony, I believe, to the Justice Department about uh, some studies, environmental oh, studies oh, sure. stuff. And she had gotten some emails from the EPA mm -hmm. telling her to change her testimony. And this was after she had already written, you know? So I'm just kind of going, what? <laughs> you know? So I don't know. People can investigate that on their own. But um, it was a lady. Well, just to that to that point, um, one of the things that we're also very focused on is watchdogging the administration <laughs> from a scientific integrity standpoint. Uh, we, we, we know that's an area that needs to be uh, scrutinized, um, given some of the actions we've already seen them take. 
Um, but with agencies like EPA, like DOE, um, these are critical science-based agencies and the importance of scientific integrity is paramount. So we're doing everything from making sure we're tracking what the administration is doing, everything from what they're doing on websites uh, to what they're um, uh, to what they're saying, uh, to the types of people that they're nominating uh, and, and bringing into the administration. We even opened up a secure uh, uh, platform, uh, an investigative platform, where folks can actually, uh, who work at the agencies, who maybe want to uh, articulate a concern, a whistleblower concern, for example, can do that securely uh, through our platform. Um, so we, we are we're positioning ourselves to try to be uh, champions for scientific integrity it is actually uh, the main core uh, uh, value of, of the organization. So we're, we're working on that front as well. Uh, take two more questions publicly. We'll, of course, be around to answer a lot more. Um, so Lauren, and I saw your hand here, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, do you think wave and tunnel power would be an effective example of how we can be innovative and get costs down like per kilowatt hour or like per, like, uh, <coughs> unit of, of power in American innovation. Like we have more coastline than Europe and we could really have our utility costs down like lower than nuclear, much more cost effective than nuclear. But it seems like it's just been stymied any opportunity that they can get because of the industry lobbyists. It, it, it comes down to priorities and spending resources on research and development so we can actually bring these technologies to a scale uh, uh, and to a potency like what you're talking about. And we are incredibly underfunded and undersupported in clean energy research and development. Actually, relative to other industries like the health industry, R&D in the energy industry is very, very low and government supported R&D in energy is even lower. Title has a lot of possibilities and a lot of us are really optimistic about where that could go. But we really need to do a lot more to actually support the research and development to get that technology at least to a point where we can start talking about commercialization. And we're just not there yet, um, but if we put more of a priority on that, we could be. And I agree, there's a lot of those kind of technologies that actually hold more promise than some of the the mature technologies that we're still trying to, to, to make work today, like nuclear, which we're seeing is really having some problems economically, so. Um, fortunately, this is gonna be our last question, and I have some reminders and takeaways for everyone. Uh, so, Just sir? Just an observation that I read recently in the New York Times about uh, the deep red states, Kansas, Iowa, North Dakota, they are generating like 30% of the power from renewables. And part of what drives that, and the governor, who is Sam Brown, who is about ready to be dead, we need more of it. And I think if you're talking to rural areas in Tennessee, one of the things to talk about is the farmers get paid to leave something like sometimes like six thousand dollars for windmill. Yep. So if you can get them to put windmills on their farms, we're struggling economically rurally. It's a way to get cash in their pockets. And I think that's a way to get the message out to the rural areas is hey, you know, let us put a windmill on our property and get a lease. I mean those kind of things. I think that's what we're going to go to the app. It's not talking about the environmental benefits as much as the economic benefits. What money the climate is going in? That's excellent. That's excellent. And again, Rob, Sarah, and I will be around uh, to answer any questions you all have. So I have a, one quick reminder to kind of get off that point. If we want to build and uh, broaden our, our delegations when it comes to standing up for science and learning about opportunities to support clean energy. So I wanted to invite you all to our webinar, our Univer uh, Union of Concerned Scientists webinar on the 18th of July. Uh, it helps teach you uh, for experts and constituents to how to build diverse delegations and to get this conversation going and including more voices in order to move the ball forward on that. Um, so we have a little half sheets, I believe, on the back table to tell you how to sign up for this and how to distribute this and, and link to it on your Facebook and having more people involved so we can get the message out. Um, some key takeaways from our conversation here is that we have a sign-on letter that enca encapsulates most of this conversation to Senator Lamar Alexander that we plan to deliver um, this upcoming uh, week or two uh, regarding the supporting clean energy technologies and clean energy 
um, innovation here through supporting the budget and making sure that we keep programs like the Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Program going. Um, so please join on and sign on that letter so we can make sure that he knows once and for all that you all are supportive of that. Um, again, maintaining interdistrict meetings, particularly as now when the markups are happening on the energy budget, um, making sure that you're coming to visit him here. And if you have the wherewithal, come to DC. We'd be ha happy to have you um, pop by our office too. Um, letters to the editor, again, to set the conversation and the tone, make sure that the Tennessean, the National Post, everyone is making sure that you all are aware of this and we're changing the conversation and is getting in front of your representatives and recruiting more colleagues and your neighbors uh, to care about this and to have an educational opportunity and just to let them know why you care about this and keep the ball ro rolling and expanding across Tennessee. Um, so again, thank you all for having us out here. This is really exciting, again, uh, to come back home and to talk to you all about this and to hear from you all about your concerns and, and what's going on with you guys. That was a really good talk, and I know most of you are very involved with this, and to stay involved, we will send out, we're taping this, and we'll send out a link to the tape so you can share that with folks. We'll send out a link to, if you've signed that sheet or you're on our email, we'll send out a link to the webinar and a link to the letter to sign on to. And please, there's a lot of great material that they brought, so please pick some of that up. Uh, before you leave, and uh, there's still a little bit of iced tea and such in the back. If you want to grab some of that, uh, please do. But thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you.